Hey guys, it's Brett Burns with The Prepared Man. We're in the woods today. The sun's shining, the squirrels are cutting. We're gonna set up a nice day camp. We're gonna look at a task-specific cook kit, and we're gonna prepare a meal that a friend and I came up with a few years ago that's one of our favorites for use on the trail. Stick with us, we'll get this camp set, we'll get a fire started, and cook up some good food. So the meal that we're cooking is a meal that um, <clears throat> actually originated in our 18th century treks. And it was something that we could carry that was light, that one man could carry everything that he needed to cook, but it gave him more than just meat. So we're definitely going to cook some meat, but we're going to cook a meal that is welcoming on the trail. I'm using my glove compartment bag that uh, I've talked about in my previous videos to do that cooking. <clears throat> and what we have is some cured pork tenderloin, oil as a lubricant, a nice apple, a few small potatoes, string cheese, and we actually brought some bread mix, some bannock mix that I want to talk about here a little bit later. So that's kind of what we have today on the agenda. We're going to dig in our pack and find a couple other things. We're finishing clearing up our little area for our fire. We'll set our fire really quick. We've harvested some local fat wood out of a down pine. Um, <clears throat> if you followed me on social media, you know that recently this area has been involved in heavy flooding. So the ground is pretty much saturated. So you'll notice my knees are gonna get uh, a little muddy today. And that's why I brought this uh, climate roamer bag pad. It's just a little bit five by seven tarp that I usually keep in my haversack. But today we're gonna use it as a ground mat. Uh, not what it's designed for, but if it can't stick with what I need it to, it has no business in my kit. So we're going to go ahead and start gathering some of our materials here, get our meal cooked up. We're going to primarily use my favorite knife to use in the field, which is my pocket knife. Today we're using a Rough Rider Camp King. We're going to do all the tasks, including the cooking with it and the fire prep. So we're going to work with a clean blade that came from my house clean, and then we're going to progressively work through our fire. So <clears throat> the idea is to just clear this area of debris. It doesn't have to be surgically clean. That's not a problem. We're gonna use some of this fat wood as an accelerant. We've got some downed wood that we're gonna burn. Shouldn't be that big a deal. So let me go ahead and dig out my cook kit and we'll talk about the tasks that we're gonna do. <clears throat> so in my pack, I have my brew kit that we talked about in a previous video. And then I also have <laughs> probably one of my favorite little kits to carry is a piece of my Ollie Camp cook set. It's the lid that's gonna serve as our skillet today. And an additional bowl that fits right inside of that that we're gonna use as a baking vessel. And I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna do that as well <clears throat> if we have time today. Very simple cooking. I, you know, I don't need that big pot, so I didn't bring that big pot. And that's what we're gonna work with. Let's start by adjusting our camera so you can see here when we'll break down those potatoes and go through the task of having the cleanest tool down to the dirtiest tool that's going to build our fire. And that way, when we're tending our fire, we can fully pay attention to just tending the fire. <clears throat> so this is going to be our fire area. It's nothing too special. It's just a simple place to build the fire. Now, <clears throat> like I said, I have this little skillet. I have this little pot. I have my brew kit. Got my little bowl that I'm probably going to eat out of today. It's literally all I have with me. This knife will be used as an eating utensil and all this prep work. So first we're going to break down these potatoes into usable pieces. Now these aren't perfect potatoes, I just stole these from my wife. So we're gonna cut them down, 
I did give them a quick rinse at home. There is no brownie points for bringing dirty potatoes and washing them in the field. You're just wasting your water. And it doesn't matter if I drop a few because it's just me. I'm not going to eat all of them anyway. We'll get those cooked up and we don't have to worry about seasoning them because one of the good things about using this cured pork is it already has enough salt in it. And you'll notice I'm just cutting these with my pocket knife. Uh, if I wanted to get in my bag and get my camp cooking knife, that's fine. But I wanted to show just the vers versatility of a basic pocket knife. I don't even have a belt knife on today. <clears throat> we'll get these potatoes broke down. And I think we're just going to cook these two. We'll leave this bad boy. He's got a bad spot in him. I'll leave him someplace else. <clears throat> so we've got that broken down knife is relatively clean we do have our handkerchief our pork is what we'll fool with last we do have this apple that needs broken down too i'll just scoot that over and for my apple i'm just going to cut it in half cut the core out of it very quickly and I know some of you guys at home probably have some safety procedures, but I've been using a knife at this point longer than most of you have been alive. And I, I've been cut, but I'm not too worried about it. We'll cut that apple down. I like to leave the peel on them. And I probably, like I said, where it's just me, I'll probably just use half the apple. This part will be my snack while I'm waiting for my meal. So this vessel can sit over here. This can sit here. And I'll go ahead and uh, I'll show you what I'm using for my oil. This is just an unblown uh, two liter pop bottle. I think this one's actually like a 24 ounce pop bottle. And I'll put just a little bit of oil in this pan. That way it can be setting. And now that all that's done, I can pay, turn my attention strictly to the fire itself. Now, my fire is gonna be simple. Right off camera here, I've got some twigs that I'm gonna keep relatively dry. I've got some other size sticks that I literally broke up on camera a minute ago right before we set camp. And I've got some fat wood here that I harvested. So let's break into my fire kit. And my fire kit's always dirty and it's always big. If you've ever been cold, you know why. I've got all my stuff here. None of which I'm going to use today more than likely. Uh, my little char ribbon, candle nub, birch bark that I've harvested actually here. That's water birch some waxed jute and some wax discs that I made up can't talk about those too much you get a cease and desist on you so we're going to go ahead and get this fire propagated get it started now since it's muddy I'm going to take these larger sticks and just build a small place literally for my fire to rest then I think just for giggles I'll go ahead and take this wax jute in my fire kit and start a flint and steel fire. And we'll try to do that on camera for you. So it's just a piece of jute that I've waxed. I'm going to wrap it around my hand a couple times. I'll show you how I prep that. There's that. I'm going to slip my knife in, cut it in the top, flip it over, cut it in the bottom. Now i got six or seven strands here, you can see. And I'll just roll them around so it loosens up the wax and I'll start pulling these fibers out. A little at a time. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want you guys to get the gist of exactly how I'm going to start this fire. Birch bark will not take... Okay. It will not easily take a spark or an ember 
So I do have to break some of these down small enough to make myself a, an ember bed. But what I'm building today is going to be, it's a foolproof fire. I don't have to worry about it. So next we'll lay our birch bark out. I want to take some of these smaller pieces of this fat wood that I harvested today, like this one. Put it back in my fire kit. Put this nice piece back in my fire kit. Because I'm going to use these other pieces. Like that one to start my fire. So now, birch bark, jute. Char cloth will go here. Just like that. And give me a nice little small piece to start my fire. Let's adjust our camera. You guys should be able to see me there. Okay, now that we got our camera adjusted, we'll take this char cloth, dig out my flint. A nice piece of Texas flint that I've got. I'm going to ding this char cloth real quick. There we go. And the amber. He's a weak one though. There we go. I'll lay it in top of the side of this other piece in my bird's nest. that and I really don't have to be in a hurry today because if this doesn't work <laughs> I'll cut it all out of the video and you'll never know okay there's that I've got so much accelerant in this let's move our camera back down so you can see I've got so much accelerant and waxes and things in this <laughs> it's not likely to go out completely That's all fat wood. And you'll notice in my fire kit then I've replenished some fat wood from this fire. We'll light that piece. That's an old wore out fire starter. I want to get rid of it too. I love to do flint and steel when I have time. And that's why you guys got to see it today. Now you'll notice I don't have a lot of split wood here and that's why I'm really laying these around to try to drive out any moisture and let them get raised in temperature and I'm supplementing heavy with all these big pieces of fat wood that I found. All that's going to be burned up before my stuff's getting on the fire so I don't have to worry about messing up my, my cook kit too much. But what I do have to worry about is just keeping track of live flame versus warm embers so while we're talking here off camera i'm gonna put up my little fire kit don't need it anymore i'm gonna watch this fire catch up so my friend and i uh he, he's primarily the person that goes with me on these trips and uh we were we were doing an 18th century trick we were shooting some flintlocks having a good time and uh, we wanted to have a meal that was small that made sense so we had some pork at the time i think we were using bacon and some potatoes and a couple of apples I always carry apples in my kit especially my 18th century kit and we cooked this meal I was like man this is really good so it's kind of what we stuck with for today You didn't hear that, and you didn't see that. It's 
So while my fire is catching and I'm keeping a close eye on it, I can get into my kits, like my brew kit, and really break it down and get all the stuff out of it and get some tea together. I'm not going to make tea today. It's too late in the day, but now would be a good time to focus on really laying all of my kit out so I'm not racing around this fire. Once it gets ready to cook on, I can just start cooking. And we're going to do this in a specific order. It's going to go pork, potatoes, apples, all in. And uh, I probably brought too much pork, but I'm not sure you can ever have too much pork. And I can hear that moisture hissing in this. Yeah, I think uh, just the next county over a few miles from here, the Kentucky River reached some record heights uh, as far as how much flood water there was and how much water was on the ground. And it was it was really a rough time. So we know that this is all, if it's laying on the ground, it's likely wet. Um, I did harvest that fatwood anyway, even though it had some moisture in it because it's, it's fatwood, it's going to be fine. But you know, we knew all of this was wet going into this today. I really wanted to get you guys something going on out in the field where you could see, you know, something going on other than me sitting and talking. So that was kind of the idea behind today, and that's where we got started. Um, in the comments, you guys are welcome to leave anything you'd like to see me cook or any methods you'd like for me to cook in this basic camping video or basic, basic camp cooking series. You can also include any information you'd like to see in basic camping. I'll be more than glad to add to that. I know that series is starting to get established. And we're going to do some packing up for trips and things like that. And, and good videos that you guys might want to see. But I really wanted to emphasize today a couple of things. Because I was going to cook this entire meal with a pocket knife. Uh, and not use a specialty knife. Because I know a lot of people don't carry specialty knives. And the reason I do that is because there's valid options for everybody. Second thing is I didn't want to take everything in the kitchen sink and specialty stoves and all this stuff because I feel like, especially in modern bushcraft, there's almost like a pay gate. And the idea that if you want to enjoy the outdoors and you want to do well outdoors and you want to do camping and you want to do bushcraft, then you're going to have to invest some serious money. And I think, you know, growing up, being young, and all of the kit and equipment that I used that I really enjoyed was not expensive kit. And I feel like that pay gate or that mindset can really drive people away from the outdoors. So I wanted to make sure that today I put that out there just as plain as I could. The idea that, you know, your kit doesn't have to be an expensive kit. You don't have to use a flint and steel if you don't want to. You know, there are other options. I could use a ferro rod. I could have dug in my pocket and get my everyday carry uh, cigarette lighter out. All of those things were options to start that fire, and you can still enjoy it. I'm not going to enjoy this fire anymore just because I did a flint and steel. It's just one of those things that it's a skill that I need to practice uh, because of my 18th century events that I'm in. And I would encourage everybody to get familiar with flint and steel, even if you don't use it often. Uh, as you can see, our fire is still ticking right away. Let's see if we can get a little closer to it. And when that smoke starts to billow, I like to take my cap off or my hat and just kind of give it a good waft. Make sure there's plenty of air getting in there because what you're seeing is a combination of smoke and steam that can actually impact your fire's ability to burn. So to give it a little fresh air, fan it with my hat a little bit, we whistle on him and try to get the fire caught up and and. Like I said, we're not in a particular hurry. But uh, this this food that we're going to be cooking is just one of those types of meals that feels good to be outdoors and be able to prepare a meal. I keep it all in that little glove compartment bag that we've talked about in other videos, that Camp Craft Outfitters. I uh, can't remember the name of it right now, but if I do, I'll, I'll put it on there pretty quick. I think it's a accessory tote, I think is what it's called. And uh, we're also going to do some light baking and things like that. And just stuff that we can do that can be fun in this bag um, and have some possibles, some, some ways to do it. 
And I set my tarp just because that tarp right there hasn't seen sunlight in a while. And I wanted to make sure it got out and got warmed up and all those good things. Um, I'm starting to sell a lot of gear, starting to get rid of a lot of gear. Things that I've tested, things that I've purchased and used and moved on from. So if you're in the trading community online, you're probably going to see some of my gear come up pretty quick. And it's just something I don't need. I don't know if you've noticed, but while we were building this fire, I actually didn't use my pocket knife other than to cut that wax jute. And uh, I'm not really worried about that. So if I need my pocket knife, I can use it again. Um, and I am going to use it to eat with today. That's always handy to preserve a blade. You know, in my flat pack kit, in my twig stove kit, I carry that uh, blade that I showed you the other day too. That flat knife, that coyote knife, or an open nail. Makes a really good camp kitchen knife as well. So you'll see our log cabin fire. It's, it's going right away. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and start heating this pan. Even though I'm not trying to cook on direct flames, but... This fire shouldn't ever get really big. I'll go ahead and heat my pan a little bit. Put a little food on. These are those little pork tenderloin. We'll just cook a couple of those. There we go. Let me put a little extra in there which they're going to render a little bit of grease a little bit of fat I'll let those cook and right after we flip them for the first time i'm going to add some potatoes but you'll notice i'm not rushing around now my fire is established. I've got a little fire going. My food is cut up. I'm already ready for that. And we're just enjoying ourselves cooking. Oop. Said we're dropping our apple. That handle is really cool because I've got it off the fire. I've got a really small fire going here. And what we're doing is we're just trying to cook this pretty slow. So like all this flame and stuff, I'm not worried about that. I can go ahead and push that over there. And I'll just set this kind of off to the side. And it'll be okay. I'm not too worried about if it gets hot, I got a bandana here. Let's let that cook slow. Throw a few of those potatoes in there. And like I said, we may not use all these potatoes. And sometimes I carry seasoning, and you'll see it in some of my kits. But this is one of those that I really don't have to worry about that with. I'll talk a little bit about some things that I've seen uh, recently. 
and uh, you know I'm fairly well versed uh, I figure I have got some pretty good experiences in life is uh, I've met some groups of people and when I say groups of people I mean quite a few people that won't eat meat on the bone and that's really surprised me it shocked me is that disconnect to the natural part of the world where yes these these uh why well, these apples here these animals were alive and uh we're eating them <laughs> i don't have a problem with that but um, it surprised me that <clears throat> apparently some people do always new experiences in life I'm cooking right away if I was cooking on a campfire I could rake coals back but uh, this is literally just a little fire to cook on it's warm today I don't need this fire for warmth don't have to worry about that and this would be the time in my kit <clears throat> that I can do things like maintain blades should I be using a carbon steel blade this is not a carbon steel blade so I don't really have to worry about it you know I could maintain my axe and things like that because none of this cooking is going to be instant so see my handle yeah that's still pretty cool still want to burn my meat and back down in there and in there you booger some of these apples a chance to cook there we go and what I'm going to do after the, everything kind of gets some char on it is uh, I'll add a little water just to soften some of this stuff up. As you can see, this is a really easy camp. Uh, Ollie Camp makes this part, this pot, with the lid. Uh, there's tons of camping skillets out there, and I'm not going to say that I prefer one or the other I will say that the larger it is typically the heavier it is and if you're just one person you probably don't need a gigantic one and uh, I will say that 20 30 bucks is absolutely outrageous to give for a camp skillet you know the most expensive part of this cooking here is the meat and I'm aware of that but uh, you know, this could be wild meat. This would go well with squirrel or rabbit or something like that. I'm not going to uh, say that I recommend eating animals like possums and coyotes. I know we've got some people out there that are doing things like that. And largely it's for the, uh, <laughs> the visuals of that and how they can surprise people with what they're doing. But uh, I don't recommend it. I'm going to go ahead and set this on there just as a way to capture some of that heat. Starting to get a little smoky. So, first thing I typically do when I set up camp is I'll set my shelter and uh, I'll stow my pack. I'll hang my pack somewhere. Then when I start this cooking process, I don't have a lot of running around to do so I get distracted from cooking. And that's what I would recommend to anybody else too. Try not to get distracted from what you're doing. Because these are my rations, so to speak, that I have. I don't have backup uh, rations when I'm on a trip. Uh, these, This is my food. So try to pay attention to your cooking. Take it serious enough that you don't have to uh, distract yourself from it with tidying your camp. And I have most of my gear out right now. I've got a fire kit out and uh, got my accessories bag that we're going to do a video on later and uh, my glove compartment bag there that's got all my cooking supplies in it, my food and stuff. But other than that, it's just me kind of sitting here and we don't have to worry about it as much. And I just listen for noise changes. Um, you hear moisture popping and cracking. So when your meats are out of moisture, they'll get quiet. And this is no different than cooking in the house, guys. I'm just sitting on the ground. But this is no different. 
I give them a little shake every so often just so I'm not eating anything that's stuck to the bottom. I'll slide down a little bit. I'm just trying to support this little coal bed here that I can kind of move it around hotter, cooler, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and you'll notice this is not a big fire. I mean, this is big enough to cook this meal on because I try to be specialized and I don't have to worry about that. In the wintertime, you know, I could have a warming fire and cook on it. And I'll rake the coals back and cook on it, but... Well, I'm just cooking a meal. You know, this is a single limb that I found and that piece of fat wood that I'm going to harvest some more of before I leave. You know, this is it. And uh, I did mess up today and I grabbed that Sea to Summit bowl. Uh, Ozark Trails does have this exact same cup. So that's an option. You know, my, my brew kit is just probably going to sit today. I got like four bucks in this here. It's a bowl that I found at a Goodwill or some type of thrift store maybe. And uh, this pan, this Ollie Camp pan, was the cheapest on the market that fit that category when I bought it. Let's go ahead and stir him a little bit. My stuff mixed up. One thing you have to worry about when you're sitting on a, oh no, I lost part of my apple. When you're sitting on these nylon tarps is uh, they don't like heat. So I have to be mindful of that. Lost part of my apple. Throw him in there. There we go. Hands start to cool down. Ease the slid back on there. Not very hot. So, this is one of those tasks that people get injured doing, is camp cooking. You know, they, get, they burn their hands, they cut their hand cutting meat, something like that. But I think the moral of the story of that, and the underlying issue is, is they're trying to multitask or trying to cut corners when they're cooking. You know, you don't have to be in a rush. You know, I prep my meal, prep my fire, take my time. Cooking a little too fast for me. Ease him off. That's the thing. You see, I've got flames here. I've got coals here. I can move in and out and get it the way that I want. Another thing, or at least where I'm camping today, is I don't have direct access to fresh water here. I would have to go quite some ways to get to the creek. And uh, it makes it hard to clean these foods up. So I would suggest, should you have the ability to cook relatively close to clean water, it's always good to have access to lots of water. I've got, you know, 32 ounces. I've got a Nalgene of water just off camera up there. And uh, that's going to be my water for the day. But... It's nice to have access to water and you don't have to worry about conserving it. Set that off. Let's see what we got going on here. And what I'm checking is my potatoes and my apples. That's what I'm checking. Potatoes and my apples. Are they done? No? Well, let's let them cook a little while. And I don't want to let any of them spend too much time on the bottom of the pan. I can already tell I got one burnt there. Get that back over there. Don't want them to spend too much time burning on the bottom of the pan or anything like that.
We'll give that just a few more minutes and then we'll start this baking project. Um, the baking project is going to be not necessarily bad, but it's going to be a little wasteful. So just bear with me on that one. We'll go ahead and cut. We're going to move the camera one more time, get it up a little bit higher so I'm not smoking you out. And I want to show you this meal finishing and our next meal for our, our bread cooking. So we're going to go ahead and take our pan. And give him a little oil. And that's probably about all the oil we got. And that's good. Let him get warmed up there a little bit. And this is a task I get a lot of heat over. I've got this Ziploc bag. It's got my bread mix in there. In my bread mix, I've got dehydrated milk, salt, things like that. I'll tell you another good secret is any of those biscuit mixes work really well. We just add a little bit of water. I don't have to stir it. I just swish it around. Let it absorb that water. My oil is getting hot. I can kind of move him off the fire. Always like to start with a hot pan when you're baking. This is how we're going to accomplish this. We're going to take this stick. Now we have indirect heat. We're going to take our mixed up biscuit mix. We're going to roll our oil around in our pan just a little bit. And we're going to add that bread mix, that biscuit mix, right on top. I will uh, tell you, the viewer, that while I was talking to my friend about this video, I said, I really hate to bake because it, it only goes to one extreme. It either works perfect or not at all. So be forewarned. We're going to ease him there on the fire. And we're going to set this on top of it and not tell anyone. Because that's going to be our baking lid. So now, now we got some cooking going. Let's see what we got here. Let's get you back over there where you can see. I'm just going to let him cook. That's so good. This is that apple. This is that potato. Bread's already starting to get warm. And what I'm doing is trying to maintain that heat. I don't want my fire to go out. But I also don't want to scorch everything. So we're just trying to maintain a little heat here. So as that cooks, and you got to really kind of watch it because that oil is going to keep it from sticking a little bit, but it's not going to do a great job. I can enjoy my meal and wait for my bread 
or I could set this to the side and do other things and come back. You see all that caramelization from the apples. Pork cooked very well. Apples still have that uh, resistance in them, but they're still very good and done. And this is a little meal that would be right at home in the 18th century, and it's definitely well welcome today in the 21st century. Just kind of give that a flop so that oil gets against the pan. The bread's starting to rise all the way around. Let's just let him cook.
So a trick that I wanted to share with you guys today, and just to, just to tell you what I'm doing, is in this particular series here, we're going to be talking about cooking. So today I'm baking. I've baked the bottom of my pot uh, without burning it. Now I want to get the top done. So I've pulled my fire off, taken these longer sticks that are not hot on the bottom, but they are hot on the top, and added heat to the top to kind of brown my biscuit on top, finish it up, and just get a better looking product and something that I would enjoy eating better. So here's a quick update guys. The, the biscuit's done now. I'm just going to try to brown the top. I added a pork tenderloin, some of that string cheese, some of those apples. Now I just want to get a good nice finished top on there. So I've pulled the heat from my fire, these long sticks that weren't burnt all the way through. I've added them to the top of the pan just to add that heat down. Um, that should get my cheese nice and melted, get my pork tenderloin set good, and my biscuit browned up. And we'll talk more about that tip when we're, we're doing some bush baking later, just with minimal gear. But uh, you can bake in the woods without a reflector oven, so I wanted you to take a look at this. On a larger scale, like in a Dutch oven, I'd be using a shovel. I'd shovel those coals on, and that always works real well for us. But today, we're just simulating that heat on top just with those long sticks. All right, guys, let's take a look. We've had uh, that heat on top from just some of the sticks we pulled out of the fire. <clears throat> All right, guys, let's take a look. We've had some of that heat on top from just those sticks that we pulled out of the fire. This is our lid that we pulled off, and you can see it's definitely going to need clean, but that's okay. Let's flip him over here, and we'll set our baking pan right on top of it. It's cold down a little bit. I want you to take a look. Look at that cheesy goodness. We've got our pork tenderloin. We've got our apples. Got this cheese nice and done. I can't wait to get a bite. So that's just a little meal that we can cook. It's definitely not ramen. It's definitely not junk. But at the same time, I can use minimal kit to cook it and minimal amount of time. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I'm going to dig in and enjoy my time here. I guess that was the end of that. Guys, I'm Brett Burns with The Prepared Man. Get outside and cook something.